All right. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the secret podcast of Laura, Laura Palmer. Palmer. I'm Paul. I'm Amanda. And today we are discussing Blue, Blue Velvet. Vulva. Blue, Blue Vulva. Vulva. <laughs> okay. Mulva. Mulva. Blue Mulva. <laughs> Um, this is actually my favorite David Lynch film. I would say it's like up there and my top favorites as yeah, well. Yeah, uh, I've seen it, I don't, countless times. Can't even, yeah, I don't know. So, right now. I don't know. But it's, so um, good. from 1986 and it has a runtime of 120 minutes. That makes sense. So he got that down to two hours. I think it, it's a good two hours. Yeah. It's solid. Yeah, yeah. but I, it, I'm referring to Dune, where <laughs> they were like, "Put it in two hours," and it just it wasn't. It just wasn't. Yeah. Put it in three hours. So Christ's sake. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, um, recap corner. Not mm-hmm. a whole lot to discuss. Not really. We had some editing issues. We had an edit, like a small edit issue. We had a huge edit issue actually, because we edited it and then uh, we lost. We lost everything, so we had to go back and edit it, like, right. another time. So, like, in in that time frame, <laughs> apparently we missed uh, four seconds? Yeah, four about three or four seconds. seconds. There was, like, a silence. So if you caught that, we apologize, whatever, you know. Sorry we're for, still learning. Sorry for wasting your time, but... Um, we're still learning. You, you know, saw Twin Peaks and... Yeah. And then the only other thing it. I wanted to announce was that, like, through listening to myself on podcasts... I realized that I don't enunciate as much as I should, and it's something I never totally realized about myself, but at the same time, you're going to have to deal with it, because I did a lot of drugs in my 20s. Yeah. Uh, I can attest to that. (laughs) And I don't enunciate. I never have, even though I did a lot of drugs in my 20s. So, um, yeah. I don't know. My brain's (laughs) fried. So just deal with me. I think you're a good orator. Thank you. You're I really appreciate good at oral. that. I oh well, <laughs> well then. Um, I've heard. But that was that was uh, pretty much it for our recaps, yeah, right? I think so yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. So it was nice to have the guest, special guest. It was so great having Black Velvet here. Special agent Black Velvet. Yeah, that was really great, <laughs> and um, it was very knowledgeable. Yeah. So we're very thankful for that. Yeah. And um, we hope you enjoyed that show. Mm-hmm. Um, beyond that, I think we can, uh, kind of, like, get into a little bit of some factoids and just personal stuff involving Blue Velvet. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. And so, I actually, I mean, I had seen Blue Velvet before, but I found the DVD in a small town called Choctaw, Oklahoma. At, like, the dollar store in, like, one of those, like, you know... $1 $1 bargain bin DVDs. I can't believe that. It's yeah. such a small town. That, yeah. You know? So I was like, Blue Velvet for a dollar. <laughs> I'm getting that. Uh, so that was... Um, Is that how you started? Is that when you... It's not it? when I first saw it, but that's when I like started really like watching it like repeatedly. Yeah. Like I do with like most David Lynch <laughs> yeah, movies. I understand. I understand. I think you were the one who introduced me to Blue Velvet. It had to have been. Maybe. you were the one who introduced me to, to David Lynch. Lost Highway was the first one oh, okay. that you showed cool. me. Cool. So. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. Like I said, 1986, 120 minutes. The producer is, um, well, obviously the director is David Lynch, but the producer is Fred Caruso. He also produced Dress to Kill. Okay. I've never seen it. I don't think I have either. And he also did The Skulls. The Skulls. I remember that with the with Percy from... Yeah. Yeah? Okay. So Joshua Jackson Joshua and Jackson. Paul Walker, yeah. like, in their Ivy League, like, cult. Cult thing. Yeah. yeah. I, so I never saw never he seen did, it. He did that movie. I remember seeing that movie uh, when I was in... Oh, God. I'm dating myself now. But seventh grade, maybe? And I had, like, a you know, quote unquote girlfriend. And that was like the first time I tried to make that move where you move your arm, like you're yawning and then you kind of put it around them a little bit. So I remember the skulls for that very reason. (laughs) (laughs) Was Uh, your first dabbling into women? Yeah. First and last. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Um, that makes sense. So anyway, this movie wa- had a six million dollar budget. What? Yeah, it was given a very small budget. Is How that small? I- oh yeah. Oh. Yeah. What? If- In fact, okay. So, 
the De Laurentiis group mm-hmm. uh, distributed this film, and like they and Dino wanted to make it happen, but they they were like, "We're going to give you a limited budget." So, David Lynch, you have complete creative control over this. Unlike last time with Dune, you had no control. Wow. Or very little control. Thank God. <laughs> yeah, thank God. So they were kind of like, uh, so it was actually the smallest, like, f- in terms of budget film that that sh- distribution group had. But wow. De Laurent just believed in him and allowed Blue Velvet to come about. And I'm glad they did. And Blue Velvet made $8 million alone in the U.S., so, oh, so they, they actually they made, they made some money back. It was a good film because Dune did not. So yeah. yeah so nah, nah. and then like that's just the U.S. So like worldwide, it did, it did pretty well. It did pretty well. Okay. Yeah. It was. I mean, it's it's so unique for its time too. It's know. very unique. So um, it's the first uh, first film of his with Badalamenti. Finally! Yay. Oh, Angelo! Oh, Angelo! We love Angelo Battlementi, oh and he goes on to do everything with Lynch after that. Yeah. So he's finally Who found wouldn't? he's found his stride. Yeah, he found his, his match. Yeah, and so um, cinematography was done by Frederick Elms, and um, I don't think they worked together after that, as far as I know. However, fun fact. Remember Lana Del Rey, how she recorded Blue Velvet? Yeah. Um, There was an H&M commercial with her doing that song. And the whole thing was like super weird, Lynchian. And um, turns out Frederick Elms did the cinematography for that H&M advertisement. Oh, that makes sense. That's crazy. Yeah. I had no idea that she did that commercial. The editor was Dwayne Dunham. I heard and, that name. Yeah. Uh, he right. did Return of the Jedi. Oh, that's right. He did Wild at Heart, um, Twin Peaks. That's why. Dwayne Dunham. Well, Twin not Peaks. all of Twin Peaks, but... Well, I've actually, his name he did that. 18 episodes of the Twin Peaks The Return. The all edi- of them? The editing. Oh, Yeah. Wow. But didn't he do and something And there was 19 them? episodes. Right. So 18. he did all... Oh, I thought it was 19. No, because it was 18 hours, remember? It was 18, yeah, okay. so he did okay. all of them, yeah. yeah. But no, I, I know I've seen his name, like, on the one of the first two seasons. Yeah, I think he only sure. did, like, two or three episodes of the actual original series. But he also, you know, he edited um, one of my personal favorites, Disney Channel's Halloween Town. What? <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of that. And, um, I didn't have the Disney Channel. I was, <laughs> I was poor growing up, relatively. I need to find... There's this, this really great thing on the internet where this guy like basically tries to do a synopsis of Halloween Town but like making fun of everything and doing voiceover. <clears throat> Who else worked on this? Uh, production design was done by Patricia Norris. She also did the production design for Lost Highway, yeah. um, Wild of Heart, and Fire Walk With Me. I can feel that vibe. I can, you know, kind of, yeah. they're all kind of similar in that way, for sure. And yeah. she's still going on. She did the, co- she's a, mostly a costume designer. Okay. And she did the costume design for 12 Years a Slave, which won oh, Best Picture. Nice. Uh, I never saw that. I'm so not up to date with I actually movies. haven't seen it either. Let's watch it. So, yeah, hey. we, should, we should watch we'll, that. It'll be a good cry fest. Yeah. Oh. But she also did uh, costume design for David Lynch's movies, The Straight Story and The Elephant Man. Oh. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. And she, uh, one of the things I noted too was that she did the production or the costume design for Scarface. Oh, cool. And one of the things I love most is like Michelle Pfeiffer's little slinky dresses yes. that she wears. Yeah, so. she looked great in that film. Yeah. So. I, I liked all the designs on that in that film. That was a good one, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah, so Patricia Norris definitely has um, a lot under her belt. She has some style. She has grace. Yeah. Rita Haywood gave good face. Um, Catherine. <laughs> Lana, Lana, too. Lana. Okay. <laughs> Lana. Lana. Lana Del Rey. Lana Del Rey. But in addition to the production design, she also did costume design for um, Lost Highway and Fire Walk With Me. Okay, cool. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, the vibe is, is there for sure, yeah. Absolutely. So um, the cast includes Kyle MacLachlan. Um, Laura Dern. Laura Dern. Um, lots of people. Yeah, a lot of people from his previous films. Yeah, Jack and, Nance, and, oh and God, like l- and David Lynch actually did not even has never had never seen a Laura, Laura Dern movie pr- 
prior to him casting her. Was this her first film, though? No. Oh. She had actually had, like, several films prior to that. Really? Um, the first one that I remember her from is Ladies and Gentlemen, The Fabulous Stains. Oh. Which is kind of a cult uh, film from the 80s about a punk band. Diane Ladd is the main character. Oh, her mom. And, no. Uh, Diane Ladd is her mom. I'm thinking of Diane. Who's the chick from um, that Kate. Richard Gere movie? Diane and Weiss? Diane no, King? No, no, no. Dame Judy D- Dench. I don't know. Judy anyway, Dench. whatever. Diane. <laughs> Diane. <laughs> Diane. <laughs> Diane. We've reached the town of Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> whatever. I don't know. Anyway, Laura Dern was in that movie, which is the first one I ever saw, like, or knew. Or is the, her first, like, film where she's actually recognized because she had some films previously that were like she was either uncredited Yikes. or like very not much a part of it yeah. um but she's like hollywood royalty in a then way, she so. was in mask in 1985 that's right oh yeah i love that film and so it makes I sense think, because like that. mask and the elephant man kind of go hand in hand a so maybe bit. he was thinking like okay laura dern well, you know? yeah yeah but did he work with his mo- her, her mom before that who uh, David Lynch, because I know they worked together in Wild at Heart, so I was wondering how he uh, came to work with Diana. As far as I Lab. know, no. Okay, I'm yeah. Just curious. But um, yeah, so anyway, um, that that's Laura Dern. Obviously, there were uh, a lot of amazing actors in this. There was Isabella Rossellini. There's Dennis Hopper. Dennis there's Hopper. Dean Stockwell. Mm-hmm. Um, Brad Delp. No, not Brad Dorf. That's the singer. Brad Dorf. Brad Dorf, yeah. Yeah. Brad Dorf's yeah. the yeah. singer from yeah. Boston. And of course, Jack Nance is always. <laughs> yeah, he's always there. Yeah, Brad Dorf and Jack Nance play like Frank Booth's goons, I which we'll get you. into. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of other people. But here's the funny thing. So I was kind of like doing some research on people that were originally optioned to be casted for this film, and most of them turned it down because of the, the content. This movie was considered way too violent for its time, and a lot of people didn't want to be attached to it because they were like, well, you know, Dune was a flop. This movie is dark as fuck. Do we want to do this? Yeah, that makes sense. So I have some fun. Sandy, Laura Dern's character, was originally going to be played by Molly Ringwald. What? (laughs) Yeah. Can you imagine? (laughs) Whose idea was that? I think David Lynch's. Jesus. She turned it down. Thank God. Yeah. And then oh. Harry Dean Stanton and Willem Dafoe were both up for Frank. Huh. Yeah. I'm kind of glad that didn't I happen. I could see Willem Dafoe doing it. Especially I cannot well see er- Harry Dean Stanton doing it. No, he's too much of a good guy. And then, he's too likable. Yeah. And then Dorothy Valens was originally optioned to Debbie Harry Blondie. That would have been cool. Yeah. Video drum. Well, but... she actually, like, she just, because of video drum, she didn't want to be cast in another, like, seemingly Sex. cult film Why she not? wanted yeah i don't know Maybe she wanted something more so she went on and did spun instead <laughs> yeah 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 no, and then know. um jeffrey kyle mclaughlin's character was originally up for val kilmer yikes and chris isaac uh, <laughs> which chris isaac does do a good job in fire walk with me yeah. but i'm so glad that he got kyle mclaughlin back for this kyle mclaughlin's like a solid actor Whereas Chris Isaac's just like a good looking like guy who can kinda act. Right. No exactly. Exactly. Good singer. Yeah. But yeah. Um there was one Oscar nomination for this film. David Lynch uh got the Oscar nomination for Best Director. Yay! Didn't win, but uh, who won? as usual. Do you know? I have no idea. Yeah, I don't know does. who won that year. It, been it was eighty six it was nineteen eighty six, which by the way was the year we were both born. Oh, it was probably like a Star Wars film or something. More than likely. Maybe. Or maybe. wasn't that the issue? Was that the last one? I don't, I don't know. know. I'm not sure. I don't either. Yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> and then... Um, what would you say it was Star Wars? <laughs> but this movie was so controversial for its time that people literally... There were mass walkouts when it debuted. Like, That's awesome. Across, yeah. And people <laughs> were like, re, like demanding refunds. There was even one guy, which I read this on either IMDb or Wikipedia, one guy fainted during the screening of Blue Velvet in Chicago and had to have his pacemaker changed. You can do that? Yeah, I guess so. pacemakers, I like guess... diapers? Or like... I don't... <laughs> How does that work? Here's what's more fucked up. 
He went back to see the rest of the movie <laughs> after I, having a pacemaker change. I, he was really into it. He just likes to the yeah. thrill of the near death experiences. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm curious, like what at what point he like fainted? Because I mean, there's not like I don't know. I mean, it wasn't that bad. But well, looking back now, I'm like, yeah. But this is 1986. We're talking about this movie was like so unusual and different for its time, you know, despite the fact that, you know... There was, like, know, horror films and stuff that were as gory. Right, but, but people thought they were going to go see a drama, and they kind of got, like, this, like, kind of neo-noir, film noir mystery murder thing they were going into, mm-hmm. and then, like, got David Lynch. <laughs> <laughs> so... Whoops! Yeah, and, and, and one of the, the uh, deleted scenes of Blue Velvet... Megan Mullally was played um, Jeffrey's college girlfriend. You, you Who's Megan? Me? No, Karen from Will and Grace. Oh what? Yeah. Oh yeah. wow! So that Who, was deleted. That was deleted. Have yeah. you seen the deleted? But it is in the deleted scenes of the new thing they put out. Oh, I haven't so seen that yet. I've watched them. I don't have a lot of knowledge, like remembering yeah. it but um i did watch it i think it's on it's out. on youtube it's on the like the criterion release and all that Nothing stuff stood out or anything like, yeah, yeah so this is a good movie without the deleted scenes yeah and well and they also needed to make it two hours because the original cut was four hours what yeah like the, the rough <laughs> what? the rough cut what what did they need what did they put in those four hours well, <laughs> go buy the DVD and find out. I don't I have, have it. DVD <laughs> go on YouTube. <laughs> uh, that. Yeah, and so uh, while we're speaking of how controversial this movie was, Isabella Rossellini was uh, a major model. She did like ads for Lancome makeup and stuff like that. Well, her modeling contractor or the company she was with dropped her <gasps> after this movie. Wow. Yeah. Was she dating David Lynch at the, the time? She started David. Or dating David Lynch at the time too. Okay. Yeah. I was curious why. Yeah. Yeah, but they dropped her because this, like this movie was so like, even um, critics had like mixed reviews. Some of them were like, "Oh my gosh, like this is great," and some of them were like, "This is terrible." But a lot of those critics came back years later and were like, "Okay, like we were wrong. This this movie is actually fantastic." Yeah. It um, is. So good. I'm glad they corrected themselves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Although uh, Roger Ebert was one of the few who was just like, I don't know. He's always shat on David yeah, Lynch, he's... and I usually like rely on his reviews or used to rely really? on his reviews when he was alive. Um, what about now that he's dead? <laughs> <laughs> I just, I mean, I, if you go online and read the reviews of movies, he's pretty spot on along a lot of the time. And he did Return to the Valley of the Dolls, and that's a great movie. Oh, yeah. Wait, not Return. Not Valley of the Dolls, but Return. Oh, see, I've never seen that one. That's, it's a, it's not a sequel. Um, it's a complete, it's its own standalone cult film. Cool. But it's, it's pretty great. Okay. So, um, yeah, uh, blah, 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 blah. Let me see I if I have know. any other notes. They're written all I over have, the uh, place. This is an MGM film. Yep. As well. Yep. Oh, you said it was timeless. This film is like... This film is timeless. It has like this really amazing quality to it where the first time I watched it, I was like, what decade is this? Because it's supposed to be like set in the 80s, but there's so much like 1950s film noir Mm -hmm. happening in it. So it's a little bit of both. Plus the music is very... It's the 50s, 60s music. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, 50s. And I think like... uh, Angelo Badalamenti really showed his chops with this because in most of his stuff in later David Lynch films, he was doing more like synthy, slow, like keyboard stuff. Yeah. Whereas this one was like completely orchestrated. Yeah, with strings. It was all, it was a huge score. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, like when it opens, when the curtain, like when it opens with the blue velvet curtain and it's like mm-hmm. the strings. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's good shit. um, It's good shit, Angelo. Love it. Good shit. Love it. Thank you. Love that. Thank you. One of the last things I was going to mention is that Dorothy Balance, uh, her name Dorothy came from The Wizard of Oz. Oh, surprise, There's always a Wizard of Oz reference in his movies. I love that. It's cute. Yeah. So, um, anyway, uh, (laughs) one thing I also noted, (laughs) which I think is kind of funny, is the F word is used 56 times in the film. Nice. Because I was curious about how many times it was used, because it's... It's all over the place, yeah. Yeah. And Frank Booth uses 
55 of those fucks. Are you serious? Yeah. Who, who's the other one? I don't know. Dorothy Valens? Maybe. Maybe? I don't know. Fuck! You tell us. Email us. Okay. So. <laughs> I think we're ready to dive into it. So, it's set in Lumberton, North Carolina. Yep. We have an opening title sequence with That's the blue right. velvet curtain serving as the background and a beautiful score. Yeah. With Angelo Battlementi. <laughs> Um, and he epic. does a fantastic job with this mysterious kind of old school, very old detective film noir style. Yeah. Um, and like the the way the the beginning credits are very you know kind of old school as well because that's kind of right. You know, credits for the beginning, kind mm. of ish. The the big credits, the big names. It definitely has lots of throwbacks to the old film noir genre. Yeah. Um, from like the fifties, and then we open up on roses. And a white picket fence. Yeah, in this in suburbia yeah. to Blue Velvet, right? Blue Velvet is is playing. Yes, the song. Blue Velvet's playing, and um, it's just like the suburban montage of like fire trucks yeah. and people like the firemen waving and the dogs. firemen's waving. Yeah, and actually, suburbia. so they used um, Bobby Vinton's version of Blue Velvet, but Blue Velvet was actually originally written by Tony Bennett. Oh. Oh, yeah. I did not know that. Who works with Lady Gaga now? They have like a show in Vegas. Is he still alive? Yep. No problem. <laughs> him, and, him and Gaga. Going for it. So yeah, yeah so that's cool. kind of the version they use for that. Interesting. Um, but yeah, you got the waving fireman. And then we cut to like Kyle MacLachlan, whose name is Jeffrey in the film. Uh, Jeffrey's mom is drinking coffee or tea or something like that while she's watching TV. And they do a shot of the TV and it just shows like an old like film noir movie with like a hand pointing like a, a shadow. gun. Shadow, yeah. It's like a hand pointing a gun in black and white. Yeah. And you know, they, they use that, I noticed like in other scenes down the road. It's like the same mm-hmm. clip. So yeah, there's like some foreshadowing happening there. And then you have like this guy outside the house, which is Jeffrey's dad. Yeah, you assume it's his as dad. We, as we discover. And then... Um, He's like watering the like grass. Like watering the grass, the plants. Yeah. Something like that. And then there's like... Um, it, there's like trouble a brewing, and there's like a kink in the hose, which represents he gets like the the dad like kind of just collapses, and so yeah. I had the kink in the water hose to me represented like the clogged artery sort of thing in the dad because it oh that makes sense it kinks I never thought down. about that because yeah. I never knew like why he collapsed I was like did he have a heart attack did he have a stroke. I just assumed it's, yeah, like trouble, there's something going on. Yeah, I don't know. Clogged. They never really say why he collapses, but the, that's yeah. a nice catch, because I never noticed the kink in the hose. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. No, there was a and kink, I've seen so. this movie like a million times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then uh, after after the the guy collapses, they have this little dog, mm-hmm. and it's just like, so the water's like spraying out, like upwards. It's hilarious. And the dog's just like biting at the water of this like... You think it's like a dead body? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you think this guy collapses dead. and the dog's like playing with the water from the hose like in slow motion. Yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden this like ominous music begins. And we're like, we start like kind of sinking beneath the surface where we're like going, like there's a shot where we're going through the grass because we just saw all this beauty. And then all of a sudden we're like deep in the grass and then we see like lots of bugs. Bugs and like darkness. Around. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which I thought like it was kind of a, th- a throwback to Eraserhead and they like, uh, uh, you know, did the zoom into the planet. And, yeah. You know, well, we're going to come to that too. Okay, there's, a, there's a zoom similar to that as well. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. But anyway, I wrote, Welcome to Lumberton. Welcome and to then Lumberton. In, and then in parentheses, Twin Peaks match. Yeah. Well, it said, <laughs> um, at the sound of falling tree. Is, is what on, they said on yeah. the radio, which is like the sound of sawing wood, which mm-hmm. is from Twin Peaks and mm-hmm. other things. Yep. He likes wood. He doesn't like wood, though. How much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could wood chuck, chuck wood. wood? A woodchuck would chuck as much wood as a woodchuck could chuck wood. I did not know that part of it. Well, I, I, that's not part of it. I'm just, that's a, that's a saying. I, like it. Yeah, that's good. I, like <laughs> I learned that as a kid. <laughs> See, I didn't know that though. It's like red leather, yellow leather. Like when you're trying to get your voice oh, like, red together. Red leather, yellow leather. Yeah. It's hard to say. Yeah. So I'm anyway, Mr. Beaumont, Jeffrey's dad, is in, is in the hospital. Um, we see Kyle McLaughlin like walking through this field. And then. That's later. He goes to the hospital. I think he. We see the hospital first. He's visiting his dad first. Well, well, sorry. He he goes 
you, you see him in the field, you, that field where he finds the ear. He, like, picks up a rock and throws it. Okay. Then it shows so him he the hangs out in this field. For, like, a second. Like, because it showed him, like, picking up a rock, which I think is the explanation of, like, why he bent down to, like, look for an ear. Or look, not look for oh. an ear, but, like, look, he's looking for a rock to throw and then, gotcha. like, down the ear. Anyway. All right. But all we know about Mr. Beaumont is that he has a hardware store, and right now he's in the hospital. He's got a hole in his trachea. Yeah, he can't talk. And this weird, like, medical device holding his head in place. Yeah. I don't know what it is. They're like these, like, braces yeah. so that he can't move his head, basically. <laughs> like he broke his neck on the way down I or don't, something? Yeah, so like, I'm like, what happened to this yeah. guy? All we know is, like, something bad happened something to him. Something bad happened. And he started crying because, you know, like, Kyle McLaughlin's like, Dad, and he just can't talk and mm. like I've actually been in that situation my great grandma was in the hospital she had the same thing and she couldn't talk so uh, it was like really hard to yeah. like deal so yeah anyway so I get Shit. it get it so yeah but yeah so then we um, have Jeffrey back in the field wandering around uh, we kind of in a clearing in the woods yeah and that's when he discovers the An ear. ear yeah and, and it's a severed human ear and it's like it's just sitting in a field. Yeah, like moldy. There's a little bit of mold it's on it. It's a little moldy. There's ants. There's ants, and I don't know. He decides to pick it up with the brown paper bag. Yeah, because that's clean. Yeah. <laughs> so Let's put like, it in there. He's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab I'm this gonna severed this. ear I'm right what here. I'm do. But he does do the smart thing, and he goes to the police. Yeah. And um, room two two one for Detective Williams. Yeah. So like when he gets to like the lobby of the police station. He introduces himself as the son of his father, who Detective Williams knows. That's right. So that's how he's able to like get through directly to Detective Williams, because his dad knows the detective. Nepotism. <laughs> well, he's not working for him. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> and uh, so there's this hilarious little like uh, thing where he, sh- <laughs> he hands him the paper bag, and the detective looks inside the bag, and then just kind of like looks up and is like, Yes, that's a human ear, all right. <laughs> His delivery was so bad. Like, but I think it was really purposeful. Bad. Yikes. I, I mean, it was meant to be like kind of like funny. Yeah. I mean, I can never tell if David Lynch if it's like supposed to be funny or if it's just like sometimes bad acting or maybe he's like exploiting the bad acting. He's like, yeah, do it like that, man. I've seen midnight <laughs> movies of this movie and every time he's like, yes, that's a human ear, all right. People just die yeah, laughing. Yeah, it's hilarious. So I feel like it's meant to be funny. <laughs> but then he tells Jeffrey, like, let's take it down to the corner and you can show me where you found it. His face was like way too excited. Like the detective's face was like super happy. Like, oh, it's an ear, all right. It's <laughs> yeah, like, kind of that's an ear, all right. So, um, the coroner determines that the ear has been cut off with scissors. Yeah, and then from the scissors, it cuts into, it, it cuts to, uh, scissors, actual scissors cutting crime tape. Mm-hmm. That's what I have next. Nice. Yeah. And then, um, nice edit. the officers were searching the field, mm-hmm. the, the field that he yeah. was in, and mm-hmm. I don't think they found anything. They no. Found... As far as we know, they didn't find anything else besides the ear, even though they did ser- they did search the field the field where the ear came from so this is the first clue it's the first clue yeah (laughs) and then uh, so I have it goes to back to uh, Jeffrey's grandma mom's house yeah Jeffrey's at home his I guess his mom and grandma both live there actually I think at the end of the movie they said it's his aunt because I have like grandma written through it but I, I remember him saying like aunt something if you do this again you're gonna get it Oh, you think it's his aunt? That's what he. That's what it said. I'm pretty. Sh- yeah, because I thought it was grandma until like the very when he said like. Aunt I always thought it off. was his grandma. Okay, maybe yeah. I'm wrong. I know because she's like way older. <laughs> way like, older. Way older. Because <laughs> she yeah, and she was in a lot of stuff too. I yeah. can't think of what. I don't know her but name, but she's so cute too. She's in a she million. was in Twin Peaks. Was she? She was like the old lady with the grandson. That's right. Yeah. She was yeah. Like, yeah. She's in a lot of sh- other shit too. And lots of stuff. Yeah. Lots of stuff. But anyway, Jeffrey's like walking down the stairs and he talks to either his his mom and aunt slash grandma. His aunt. <laughs> his mom. aunt is much <laughs> older than his mom. But, <laughs> uh, he's like, I'm just gonna go walk around, and uh, his aunt slash grandma is like, Well, you're not going to link down to Lincoln, Don't are you? Don't go by Lincoln. You're yeah. not going down to Lincoln Street. Uh, at which point we see that the TV that they're watching has another, like, black and white old footage of, like, legs that are kind of creepily or steadily walking upstairs. Walking upstairs. Another foreshadowing. Detecting, detectively. Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize the foreshadowing, for sure. Yeah. yeah going well, upstairs. there's the gun and there's the stairs, uh, like, on the TV. Yeah, 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 good call. Yeah. 
And then we get like that, of course, our Lynchian weird thing where we zoom inside the ear, eraser head style. Yeah. Or so we're going inside the ear. Inside of it. And now we're now we're inside the story. Now we're in blue velvet. Yeah. And so he's walking outside, right? And then um, he. Uh, I, he doesn't really. He doesn't explain where he's going, which just shows him walking. He just in the says he's going for a walk. And then, um, but he goes to the de- de- to the detective's. the detective's house. On the way there, he sees Jacques Jacques Renault, the guy who played Jacques Renault. Was that him? I'm pretty sure. Oh, with the uh, the puppy. dog yeah. that's just like standing there. Yeah, like, he's just, like standing there, like awkward. I feel like they got that from or, or Donnie Don Darko, Darko got that from this movie. Yeah, because there's that weird like yeah, the big guy holding the dog and. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the only thing that that would make sense. And Just standing awesome. there awkwardly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, anyway, Jeffrey goes to Detective uh, Williams' house to follow up. And house tw- number 128. Nice. Good catch. <laughs> Good catch. You got numbers. Good. I only took the number of Dorothy's apartment. But Actually, I don't know if I have that. <laughs> it's 710, I think, but we'll get there. Okay. Um, so, that's... so he goes there, and, like, we get a shot of, like, a picture frame with Laura Dern in it. And so we know now, like, oh, okay, so the detective, his daughter is Sandy Laura Dern. Laura Dern, yeah. And um, I have written down, I think something the, the detective said was, like, it's horrible, too. I don't remember in what it was, like, response to, but it was just He's really... talking about his job, because Jeffrey's kind of like, it must be really cool being a detective. <laughs> like, isn't that fun? And he's just like, yes. But it's horrible. Too. Yeah, his face like changes like <laughs> yeah. a second. Like, like yes, it's horrible. Too. Just very drastic. <laughs> like it's wonderful. It's horrible. Uh, <laughs> this delivery, man. It's yeah. Crazy. And the detective basically says like, I can't say anything to you. It's like you know, police it's business. Police business. Can't do it. And nope, like, nothing Kyle's, I can do. He's so excited about this whole ear thing. Like he's yeah. way into it. Like, I think he's bored. That's why he's throwing rocks out in the field. Yeah, it's true. Good call. Yeah. yeah. So he's. Just just like looking for something to do. Looking for some ears to put together, <laughs> I guess. And so then he leaves the house, and that, uh, as he's leaving, is when Laura Dern, who plays the role of Sandy, she kind of emerges from the darkness outside of the house. Yeah, she's, it's pretty cool. She's been kind of taking a walk, and uh, first thing she says is, are you the one that found the ear? <laughs> How romantic. And I wrote, and I just wrote, amazing score by Angelo at this point. Um, <laughs> yeah, because the strings come on when she comes out. Like, mm-hmm. It's, pretty, really it's kind funny. of like this big reveal, like she's an important character. Yeah. She is. Yeah. She's and, like, where's my dream? And so Sandy, <laughs> so Sandy's like, oh, I remember you from high school. Because he's a graduate and she's still in high school. So. Um, she, they're talking about the ear, I think. They get kind of talking about the ear. She's overheard her dad. Yeah, and she's like, I don't really know anything, but um, Jeffrey's kind of being like, well, do you know anything, like, at all? And she's like, well, I can, I overheard there's a woman singer who's being investigated and lives nearby where you found the ear. And then that's when she takes him to see the building that this woman singer lives in, which just so happens to be on Lincoln. Lincoln! Yeah. Uh oh, you're not going down to Lincoln, are you? Oh yeah, we are. Yeah, we are now. And then oh yeah, because like, they they walk down here and it's supposed to be like a bad area and these mm-hmm. people like drive by and cat call. They're Lord like, Durham. hey baby, hey baby, <laughs> hey babe. <laughs> yeah. Babe. I think they're like in a, like a '50s car too. Yeah. Like, hey baby. And they weren't even like that threatening. No. It was. But like, the whole thing is just like what? Something. Yeah, it was pretty funny. It's funny. Yeah, it makes you laugh. It makes you laugh. Oh, um. So they they go and look at it. And then they're kind of like walking back, and they have this little flirtatious walk, which oh, is, which is hilarious. Well, I remember he point he points out this this house. He's like this this guy named whatever used to live here, and he had the biggest tongue in the world. Yeah, you and know, it was I, really awkward. He said, "You know, I used to know a kid who had the biggest tongue in the world." And she's like, "What happened to him?" And he goes, "I don't oh, know." No. Cool story. <laughs> yeah, cool. cool story, bro. <laughs> and then he's like, "Have you ever seen the chicken dance?" Yeah, and he, like, chicken walk. <laughs> he walks like a chicken back and forth. Yeah, like around that. her. Yeah, and that was like, it. Just like five seconds. She's, she's like, you're funny. Yeah, <laughs> so. she's like, you're weird. And that kind of reminds me of the Donnie Darko like exchange between you know the Gretchen and Donnie Darko as well. Mm-hmm. Like you're you know you're weird. That's a compliment kind right. of thing, and you know just awkward love. Awkward yeah, love. 
So then, um, after that, Jeffrey's at Beaumont's Hardware, which his Wait, wait, I have one thing written. Oh, okay, go ahead. Oh, so when they're doing the, like, walk, uh, Jeffrey goes, kind of walking, like, goes to, like, reach his hand around her shoulder, and she just kind of, like, dodges it (laughs) for a second. I don't know if I ever noticed that. Yeah, because I, like, wrote it down, and it was like, I just, like, LOL'd. Because she like whoop. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, she's the like, hardest. I don't know They're about like, this yet. Yeah. Chicken walk? What? <laughs> you just did a chicken walk and told me about some guy who With had the biggest big tongue. tongue in the world. Which I'm curious, how did he know that? No explanation. It's just well, even she's like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Like, um, <laughs> so, yeah. He's at Beaumont's hardware store. Not a lot happens. There's like there's a blind guy. Okay, oh, so the blind a, guy. Yeah. The, yeah, the blind guy in the back. Yeah. So like the, the he works there, and right. I think it's kind of weird that so they're like testing him. Like, how many fingers am I holding up? And there's obviously, like, a guy and tapping. he always knows. Yeah, and it's kind of like, oh, are you just, like, using this disability for your amusement? Nah. But they also, like, <laughs> hand him, I think, like, an axe or something at some point, like some customer does, and, like, he knows the price, like, immediately just by, like, holding the handle of the axe. <laughs> and That's so, kind of weird. Yeah, so he's very uh, intuitive. He's but been this, there for a while. This scene really doesn't have anything to it's do really with it. It's really weird. It's kind of like, they could have cut that, yeah. I think. Yeah, they could have. Yeah, 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 I agree. Uh, I guess it just—I guess it just demonstrates this is Jeffrey's dad's suburbia, store. like, but yeah, just yeah, like oh, yeah. innocence. Yeah. And Big Ed is there, or no, no, it was called the Double. His name Ed. is Double Ed. Yeah, which reminded me of like Big Ed. Double Big Ed, Big. Double R. Oh, Double R. Yeah. yeah Big know. and Double. Double Ed. Double D. Yeah. Whoops. And um, um, I don't know the actor who played him, but it reminded me a lot of Richard Pryor from Lost Highway. Oh, I uh, forgot he was in that. Yeah. Wow. So I'm like, was that Richard Pryor? I don't, I don't think, think I don't so. think so. I would have recognized him. But yeah. the characters are very similar. But yeah, it was kind of strange. Once we, once we cross Lost Highway, I guess we'll get to that. We'll get to in, that in, a, in a new podcast. <laughs> Part of the time. And then, yeah. so now he's in the high school. He's at the high school. He pulls yeah. up in a red, he's in a like, red convertible. <laughs> yeah, he's in a cool red convertible <laughs> outside the high school. And he asks Sandy, are you hungry or thirsty or both? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thirsty. <laughs> and then meanwhile, Sandy's friends are like kind of like nearby looking, and and like, oh, he's cute. Well, they're not even like always oh, cute. They have this like gray line where <laughs> this girl goes, "Boy, he is nice looking," <laughs> <laughs> which is so like something David Lynch would say. And it's so fifties too. Yeah, nice and, and, yeah. Looking. He's so nice looking. He's so handsome. Yeah, and so. Uh, so she's like, she goes to her friends, and she was like, don't tell Mike, my boyfriend. So what's yeah. up with the high school boyfriends always being called Mike? <laughs> right. Yeah, like, well, this was, I feel like this was kind of the uh, setup for Twin Peaks in certain ways. I can see like, that. There's a lot of Twin Peaks parallels. Yeah, I can see that. Except for they made the ingenue, like, a, a bad girl, you know, in Twin Peaks. Right. Yeah. Who plays Laura Dern for, what the fuck, Shirley? Yeah. Yes. Shirley. Sure. And so uh, she hops in the car and they go to Arlene's diner. Her name is Arlene and it is night. Yeah. <laughs> I thought of that too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he's like, have you ever been to Arlene's? And she's like, of course. So they go to Arlene's and that's where Jeffrey sits there and he says, quote, there are opportunities in life for gaining knowledge and experience. Sometimes it's worth taking a risk. So then he suggests to... So then Jeff su- suggests to Sandy, uh, let's sneak into the woman singer's apartment. I'll pretend to be pest control. And you pretend to be a Jehovah's Witness. And if things go wrong while I'm in there as pest control, you can come up uh, with, I have some, what are they called? Lighthouse magazines? Or oh, that's right. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, what Watchtower the, magazines? I don't remember the name Whatever of the Jehovah's but Witness magazines just, like, are. Had, he had magazines just around. Yeah. Like, why? Why? I don't know why. I mean, maybe he experienced someone moment. at his own door with those. But he's like, I have some Watchtower magazines to, so that you can use. Xenu, later. Right. So they, they go to the, they, get, they decide, like, let's go to her apartment. And even though she, like, Sandy's reluctant, but Jeffrey's like, let's do mm-hmm. this. Um, one of the things oh, I... Awake magazine, sorry. Awake magazine. Awake magazine. That's what it is. Sorry. Uh-huh. So he convinces her, like, this is what we're going to do, even though it's, like, totally risky and kind yeah. of breaking in. She's like, I don't know, but I guess let's check it out. Because she likes him. She wants to She stress. likes him. Okay. One of the things I noticed was that uh, Dorothy lives in Deep River Apartments, 
which, if you remember from Mulholland Drive, Naomi Watts' character comes from Deep River, Ontario. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. So there's a little bit of a connection nice, there. Nice, nice. Mm-hmm. And um, so now they're at the apartment, right? Yeah, so they go, and um, that's when Sandy's like, floor. the woman's name is Dorothy Valens. Oh, okay. Um, she's like, you're going to go in for three minutes. If you don't come back out of the three minutes, then I'm going to go up and pretend to be a Jehovah's Witness to get you out. Yeah. So Jeff walks into Deep River Apartments, and the elevator's out, so he's got to use the stairs. Like the foreshadowing. Like the foreshadowing, yeah. So you can only take the stairs because the elevator's not working. And it's the seventh floor? So do I yep, have that she lives on the seventh floor. And it's apartment seven ten. Yep. Okay. Um, so then he gets to her place, and uh, he's like, "Yeah, I'm pest control." He's got like the suit, like the can, all that. And Dorothy's like, "I don't like that stuff. It stinks." And he's like, "Oh, this is the new stuff." So I'm assuming he probably just filled it up with water, water or alcohol. It's water, just probably. Just kidding. Yeah, um, and he just kind of sprays her apartment just casually. She looks kind of nervous. Yeah. She's just kind of like, why are you here? Like, uh. Mm-hmm. And then um, there's a knock on the door. And you think, oh, Sandy is going to rescue him. And turns out to be this guy in a, the yellow, in a yellow suit. He's in a yellow suit jacket. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yellow suit jacket. And, and they uh, kind of have like a quick altercation. Yeah. So well, they know each other. But while this is happening, Jeff notices there's like an extra set of keys hanging beneath the kitchen counter. And he steals them. Wait. Grabs him. He just takes him. What an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> so he's hoping those are like the spare keys to her apartment. Because he didn't get a chance to open the window to, to get in. Yeah. So um, So he just kind of leaves after that. He, he, he uses that opportunity to leave the house. And he meets Sandy on the way down. And, you know, they explain like, oh, my God, this guy, you know, stole my part. And then mm-hmm. uh, they kind of just leave and. That's it. Oh, well, he yeah. about the, the He's keys. back in the car, and he tells her that he plans to sneak back in on Friday night. And he's like, can you come? And she's like, well, I got a, I got a date planned with Mike. And there was, like, sad face. Yeah. <laughs> so she's like, maybe after. I love Mike. And she also reveals at that point, she's like, one thing I do know from overhearing my dad talk is that Dorothy sings at a place called the Slow Club. Slow Club. I love that name. Yeah, and she's like, so I'll go with you there later. Yeah. Um, and then she also says, um, she was like, oh, I have a date, but he was like, oh, come on, Sandy. And she's like, oh, okay, I'll tell, I'll tell Mike I'm sick. And then she's, and then she says something really funny. She's like, I just want to be clear. Like, I love Mike. What do you want me to do? <laughs> yeah. So she's, she's kind of torn in the same way that, I don't know, Jeffrey's character is torn later on. Yeah, so. that's true. Yeah. She's caught, but she's caught, like, in, like, an innocent world, and he's caught between two worlds. Two, yeah. So, um, anyway, once they actually get to the slow club, which has this nice little slow-mo shot over the, <laughs> the front of the club, it yeah. just, like, neon lights, the slow club. I love it. It's cool. So great. And, um, they're drinking Heineken. Yes. And he tells Sandy, I love Heineken. Do you like Heineken? <laughs> yeah, and, it's And she's like, my dad drinks Bud. And he's just like, ah, the king of beers. <laughs> <laughs> that was very strange. She's like, man, I love Heineken. Mm-hmm. Cool. <laughs> so Dorothy, um, she appears. The lounge singer come. The lounge singer comes out, and she's like in a slinky black dress and has like wild, like a wild black wig, mm-hmm. slash hair. Is it black or blue? Or is a blue light on her? It's a blue light. A blue light. Yeah. Okay. And it's really pretty. Yeah. Blue and red. Kind yeah. of contrast. And one of the the interesting factoids that I found out is the piano player is Angelo Badalamenti <gasps> in that scene. No way. Yeah. Uh, I want to watch it again just for that scene. Yeah. Ah. So that's kind of cool. That is really cool. Uh, uh, I never knew that. Yeah. I didn't know that either until I was like doing research for this podcast. Uh, that's crazy. Yeah. We missed it for years. I mean, yeah. For a decade. So and I was half. like, oh, wow. Wow. He's so cool. I just got to, like, plug that he's just, like, fucking awesome. I love yeah. his music. He's great. Thank you, David Lynch, for choosing him. Oh, Angela. Oh, Angela. Okay. Um, so, okay. So they know, like, Dorothy's singing at the club, so they're like, hey, like, while she's here, why don't we go back to Dorothy's <laughs> and investigate? Yeah, let's break in. Yeah. Oh, and she sings Blue Velvet. I don't know if we mentioned that. She does sing Blue Velvet. Um, yeah. It's a very weird version. It's kind of, like, really sad and... I don't know, like the ending with the piano, like the trickle down and mm-hmm. her like 
end note just was it just leaves a lot of tension yeah so i thought that was kind of interesting to use that like musically mm -hmm. so agreed <laughs> so agreed. back to the apartment yeah yeah so like uh they go back to the apartment but jeffrey's like does it, he doesn't want sanity to get into any trouble so he's like take my car home um while i investigate he's like just park it outside your house and i'll, I'll walk back and get it and then um she's like well you know i'm gonna like honk the horn and just in case somebody comes up yeah four she times. decides to stay just to keep watch yeah okay and then the, the funny thing is she's like i'm gonna honk the horn four times like this and then she demonstrates like as if he doesn't know how to count <laughs> one two three four <laughs> And then right before he gets out of the car, she's like, I don't know if you're a detective or a pervert. And he's like, well, that's for me to know and you to find out. <laughs> Aww. Romance. Such so creepy. Ro <laughs> such romance. I know. He's like, he's like really innocent, but he's also kind of like weird and creepy in a weird way as well. There's something, he's I don't just know. a weird guy. There's something off about him. Yeah. Yeah. So. He goes upstairs and there's like that. You know, that Angela music where it's just like that brooding, you know, kind of, uh, yeah, like the, you know, just yeah. there, like atmosphere. Like ambient atmosphere, yeah. yeah. And the, the, the key works, the key that he found. The key does work. And going back to the fact that Dorothy lives in 710, I did the numerology, and that makes the number eight, mm -hmm. which according to Twin Peaks The Return is the number of completion. Interesting. It means infinite or whatever. Oh, that makes so, sense. Okay. I don't know. That was something I picked up on. Yeah, yeah. So he sneaks in with the keys that he had stole from earlier, and one of the first things that he sees while he's investigating is like a little child's birthday hat with a spinner on top. Yeah. And so he knows there's like a child involved, I believe, through that, and. And then he goes pee. Right? And he goes. Is there else he goes to take a piss, and then like as he's peeing, he's like, ah, Heineken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then he flushes. He and flushes. Laura Dern is honking at the same time. That's, yeah, people pull up as he's flushing, and so she's honking, but he can't hear it because the toilet is flushing. I mean, is it that loud? I mean, the toilet. I mean, I, mean, I, don't, know. I don't know. In a quiet house. I don't, I don't so. know. No. So, anyway, Dor <laughs> Dorothy enters her own apartment. And By herself, right? Yeah, but she's saying goodbye to someone. She's like, okay, Jimmy, see you tomorrow. Oh, I didn't notice that. Yeah, so she's just like, it's bye. Jimmy. I don't know. Probably one of Frank's... Goons. Interesting. Yeah. I never noticed that. Yeah. So Jeffrey is like, oh shit. And so he goes and hides in the living room closet. And there's this closet has like wooden blinds that you can kind of see through. So he's kind of spying on her and also trying not to be caught at the same time. And uh, she, she, like, there's a couch right across from this uh, closet. And she gets on, on all fours. I think she takes her clothes off, right? Like, she yeah. gets, starts getting undressed, and she gets it down on all fours, and uh, pulls out... She doesn't get in clothes yet. Oh. She actually, uh, the phone rings first, and that's when we, she, it's someone named Frank on the phone. And she's like, hello, Frank. And then she's like, you don't really know what they're talking about, but you hear something like, please let me talk to him, sir. And then a pause, and then she's like, Don, it's all right, don't worry. Yeah. She's like, Donnie, So, Donnie. yeah. So, then, um... She, that's when she, she kind of gets on all fours and she pulls out a photo frame beneath her couch. See, I thought it was like a Coke tray. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's a, it's a photo frame that she's hidden beneath her couch. And she looks at it and then kind of just writhes on the floor sadly in her underwear. Yeah. Because she's gotten undressed by that point. So. She's like all depressed and you don't know if she's like intoxicated. Something's wrong with her. Yeah. Well, something's going on. <laughs> As you find out. <laughs> and um, I think... Then uh, Kyle McLaughlin makes a noise. Yeah, in the something closet. like drops in the closet that he knocks over. Yeah, and then she gets a knife. She gets a butcher knife out of the kitchen because she hears it. And then she opens the door. Surprise, Kyle McLaughlin! <laughs> Whoa! And at this point, she's wearing her blue velvet robe. Oh, she is? Okay. Yeah, she has put that on before yeah. she had heard the noise. Okay. And then. Um, I just said uh, I noted the sound design for the dialogue is amazing in this scene because it really does sound like an old school movie. Yeah. Like the um, something about like the way Dorothy Valen speaks, it sounds like a fifties movie. Yeah. So, kudos to that. Yeah, it sounds great. Yeah, I agree. And she's like, "What do you want?" 
And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> he's like, I'm just here. <laughs> Who are you? What are you doing? You know what I mean? She's And then she, like, demands that he gets undressed. And gets her, yeah, he gets his wallet. She gets his wallet, right? Or yeah. Something like that. Because she, she asks his name, and he's like, Jeffrey. And she's like, Jeffrey what? And he's like, Jeffrey nothing. And then she kind of, like, nicks him in the face with the knife. And then, yeah, she's like, what's your actual name? Give me your wallet. And yeah. Then, yeah, and then she, like, makes so him... Then he's down to his, like, plaid boxers that he's wearing. Yikes. And she pulls him down. I notice he has, like, a huge wedgie, too. Oh, does he? Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> like, you could have just, you know, heard the scene. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, so she pulls his boxers off, so he's completely naked now. And, and she just says, don't look at me. And then a knock comes well, at then, the door. Oh, she also said, like, do you like it when I talk like that? Or, yeah. And then it was really weird. And Jeffrey's like, no. really not sure how to respond. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's kind of freaked out because she's like, starts off pretty violent and like aggressive, but then like, she starts like kissing him, like whenever like sh- she gets down to his boxers. Like, yeah, she she's like, like kind of kissing his hips. Yeah. And so his it's thigh. kind of like, is this know. a weird rape scene or you don't know? Yeah, I don't know. I guess like maybe this is like, she has a sense of control in the situation because she knows this guy is like not going to be. Like, He's not a threat to her like the other people in her life yeah. are. Yeah, that's true. So match made in heaven. Yeah, and then anyway, yeah. So uh, knock at the door. She puts him back in the closet. And she's like, "Hide in the closet. He'll kill you, or I mean it." So she's like, "Get your ass back in the closet." Thanks. So he does. And then we finally get Dennis Hopper, who plays Frank Booth in the movie, and he walks in with his like leather jacket, and she entered. She said she greets him and she's like hello baby and he just goes shut up it's daddy you shithead where's my bourbon can't you remember anything (laughs) that's his first line yeah (laughs) shut up shut up it's It's daddy Daddy, you shithead (laughs) that should be the name of our album right so she pours him a glass of bourbon and and as he as he's drinking it He's like, that's when he goes, now it's dark. She turns the lights off, yeah, and he's like, yeah. now it's dark. Now which it's I love dark. that fucking line. Such a great line. Yeah, it's creepy. It's one of the most iconic lines, I think, in the entire film. It's stuck with me throughout, like, the entire time that I, from the very first time I watched it. Yeah. So, yeah. Now it's dark. Now it's dark. And then he's like, spread your legs. And so he downs, like, a whole glass of bourbon and, like, right. one sip, like basically. Right. And that's when he's like, don't you fucking look at me. Which is funny, because Dorothy had just told uh, Jeffrey, to, don't look at me. Yeah, so we know where it comes from. Like, we know where her anger comes from. Yeah. And then he pulls out that weird, like, oxygen mask thing. The that nitrous he car- oxide, yeah. Yeah, which I found out is amyl nitrate. Oh, that makes sense. They don't yeah. say it in the movie, but uh, in fact, like, uh, oh. I read that David Lynch had originally wanted it to be helium so that no, <laughs> Frank no Booth way. would have, like, this high pitched voice. Oh, my voice. fucking God. <laughs> and, and Dennis Hopper was like, no, make it amyl nitrate because it's supposed to make people, like, more sexual and experience, like, weird kind of euphoria. So it was actually Dennis Hopper's idea to make it amyl nitrate, although the film never says what it is. That's what it's supposed to be. I mean, I probably think that he did that also so he didn't have to have a fucking high voice. Yeah, and then David Lynch agreed because it it took away, because that would have taken away from the seriousness of the scene. Wow. I'm glad that happened. Jesus Christ. Yeah. (laughs) So he, like, takes some deep breaths from this, like, amyl nitrate oxygen, whatever mask. And looks get, really fucked and up. Gets all weird, like wide eyed. He's like, Mommy, baby, baby wants, wants to, to fuck. <laughs> and then he punches her. Yeah. He's like, Don't look at me. I don't don't you fucking don't look, look at me. me. And he's like, Baby wants blue velvet. And then he takes a taste of her blue velvet robe that she's wearing. And he's she's like, like, Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> he's like gnawing on it. And then he uses scissors, by the way, because we mentioned scissors earlier, because yeah. the ear had been cut off with scissors. He uses scissors to cut off a piece of a robe for himself. And that's when he's like, Daddy's coming home, don't you fucking look at me. And he rapes her in this, like... Weird. This, I don't want to say hysterical, but it's... It's pretty It's comical. bizarre. It's, like, dark and funny at well, the I mean, same like, time. Well, I mean, like, he barely even, like, unzips his pants. Like, he doesn't He gets show. off in, like, seven seconds. Yeah, but it's, and it's, like, this... It is comical. He's, like, all... Oh, oh, yeah. Like, just convulsing on the it's floor. Not, like, he's having a seizure. Yeah. It's, it's weird. not a scary rape scene. It's just, a, like, a bizarre rape yeah. scene. And the then, violence is scary, I'm yeah, sure, if you've yeah. been raped and stuff. And I had, uh... I had read that David Lynch, um... Whenever they were at the... He was at the screening of this movie with Isabella, 
he was like laughing at this scene or whatever and Isabella was kind of like why is he laughing at this scene <laughs> but then she went back like after like David Lynch would talk to her about it and then she's like oh this scene actually is hilarious is so funny. she agreed like the scene is is funny even though it's a rape scene it's a rape scene, scene. <laughs> with violence but I think like you have to kind of make it a little bit lighter or else it's going to be a really serious film you know? I mean it is a serious film but there's so much like cheesiness to it the this, this helps you know keep it in line like exactly. with the rest of the the thematics of the film yeah yeah I agree yeah so after he rapes her he's he tells her you know you stay alive baby do, do it, for it for Van, Van Gogh, Gogh. <laughs> yeah what does that mean well Van Gogh cut his ear off oh yeah oh. yeah Smart. Yeah, oh, so okay. he was basically referring to her husband, like, mm. do it for Van Gogh. Oh. Yeah. And one second, let me grab a light power. Do it for Van Gogh. Do it for Van Gogh. So, yeah. Stay alive. So, oh, yeah, oh, wait, he also starts to do, before that, he had he had scissors. He was, like, doing, like, scissors next to her ear while he was, before he was going to rape her. Yeah. And I was thinking, like, scissor ASMR. <laughs> scissor ASMR? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually, I enjoy a little bit of scissor ASMR sometimes. I like to get a fake haircut when I'm trying to go to sleep. Really I find haircuts good. relaxing. I too. I'm into ASMR. I like it. I like being touched I, on my head. It's fucking weird as shit, but it definitely relaxes me. I never got into it, but I can see where it can be appealing. I like it more than guided meditation. <laughs> I just, yeah. I like, I don't really meditate at all. I don't know. It, it definitely gives me those weird tingles in the back of my head That's or whatever. Really cool. I don't know why. That's cool, though. It I works guess, for some people. Yeah. Yeah, but it works, it works, right? Yeah. So, okay, so do it for Van Gogh. Do it for Van Gogh, and then he leaves. Yeah, and wait. Okay, so Kyle, like, comes out, mm-hmm. and... Well, he comes out of the closet to see, to check on Dorothy, because he's, he's concerned at this point. Yeah, she's like, go, you need to leave. And But he helps her lie down on the couch. Right. Like, kind of picks her up she's and like on lies the ground. her down, you know. And he tries to comfort her, but she's like, I don't like that. And then... Uh, yeah, that's right. And she calls him Don, right? She, yeah, Don. She's like, oh, Don, Don, hold me, I'm scared. And so... So then he, like... So it's, like, this weird, like, love-hate thing that she was like, you know, like, hit, like, hit me, but don't leave me, and leave me, but don't stay. She's conflicted at this yeah. point. I think she's kind of in shock a little bit from being raped. Yeah. And then, but... In a weird way, she's warmed up to him because she feels like she can trust him despite the fact that he broke into her apartment and hid in her closet. Yeah, it's a little... But he, compared to the other people she's involved with... He's a with, great guy. He's a great guy. <laughs> what a catch. What a catch. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, she's calling him Don, holding I'm scared. And, uh, and then she asks, like, Jeffrey, do you like me? And Jeff's like, yeah. And she kind of invites him to cop a feel, and so he starts touching her boobs. And do they... They don't have sex. Not yet, either. no. But he does comply when she kind of, like, guides him to touch her breasts. And then she begs him to, like, hit... Yeah, she... she, begs, she yeah. yeah. She wants him to hit her. And he's like, no way, man. Yeah. Like, I'm not doing that. And it's kind of weird, because, like, why would she want that, like, after she just got raped? But, you know, people get fucked up after that shit. So, yeah. 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 So it kind of shows, like, her just, like, she's confused. She's completely lost mm-hmm. as a person. Just like and, tied up in bad shit and because he doesn't hit her they both just get dressed because she's not into it anymore yes. she basically just walks away like fuck this she's like, dead. and so Jeff's like okay and he leaves but not before as she's uh, I think in the bathroom or a bedroom or something he pulls out the photo from under the couch the picture frame that she was looking at earlier and it's, he sees a man and a child and the child in that photo has the hat with the spinny with the on spinner. top yeah. that he had so saw earlier sitting in the apartment. So we know who it belongs to. Yep. Yeah. So. so then, like, there's the crazy montage. And then there was, like, this oboe that makes it, like, very noir feeling. I know. I noticed, oh, yeah. Like, that kind of made it. Yeah. Yeah. And well, he says, oh, my God, that hat. Mm-hmm. So, okay, yeah, so there's the dream montage and the weird sound effects. And which is like everything, oh, every he's David a dream. Lynch movie ever is yeah. the weird montages. And so this one has like kind of the weird blurry face of his, of his dad. Yeah. And then there's like a burning candle that's like making this like really loud like now it's dark. flame noise. And then there's like a shot of like Dorothy being hit. Um, 
and yeah. Basically, he's just like reliving. He's dreaming about what happened, and yeah, I remember when the, when the ha- candle goes out, it says now it's dark, which I just love. I don't know, it's just creepy as fuck. It's so good. Yeah, and so um, then he wakes up and he calls Sandy, and he wants to meet her for lunch to kind of tell her what's going on. He doesn't tell her everything, <laughs> but um, right. he seems like really somber. He's like. Okay, so... Or did you have anything else? With well, he day? goes to work first, okay. and there's, like, kind of a funny small scene, but nothing really happens there. Like, the whole, like, Beaumont's hardware store stuff doesn't... Yeah. I feel like they could have cut it out. Um, yeah, we know he works at a hardware store. But, yeah, then he meets with Sandy later, and they're sitting inside of his... Or the car outside of a church. And there's kind of, like, this chapel music playing at the same time. Yeah. And... Like redemption. Like, yeah. you need to come to Jesus. So he, like, kind of fills her in on all the details that he knows, yeah. and he says, It's a strange world, Sandy, and Dorothy is married to a name, or to a man named Philip. I don't know how he figured out the name Philip, because they I never... I thought it was Don. I thought it was, like, Donnie. Don is her child. I thought, I thought like, there was Donnie, like, Sr. and Donnie Jr., because they, I he don't said, know. Dorothy is married to a man named Philip. I don't know wow. where he got that info. <laughs> it's, not in, miss, it's not in the movie. I missed that 100%. Yeah. And he's like, I think Frank has kidnapped her husband and son. Frank cut his ear off as a warning for her to stay alive. Wow. Why would he? That's why he's like, stay alive, baby. Do Do it for Van Gogh. Oh, okay. And then I remember he starts crying. And he's like, why are there going to be people like Frank in this world? Why is there so much trouble in this world? Why are there people like Frank? And that's when Laura Dern has, which is my favorite part of the entire movie, her monologue, yeah. where she talks about her dream. <laughs> She's like, I had a dream. And, um... Go on. She's, I, I don't have it in quotes, but she basically just says, like... She's talking about, like, we're in the world and it's dark because there weren't any robins. <laughs> and the robins represented love. Then thousands of robins were set free and flew down a blinding light of love and it seemed like that love would only would only make any difference and it did so i guess it means there's trouble till the robins come that's what i got from it yeah. <laughs> like, but what? it's like the way she delivers like these cheesy ass lines is like you're both like into it and laughing at the same time 100 percent, yeah which is, it's such a bizarre dream yeah. You're like, oh, she had a dream about love, and then it's like, and their birds represent love yeah. and whiteness. And we're, we're just like, what? But they're talking all like as if this is a normal conversation yeah. that people have. Well, and duh. It's, it's birds not. are not. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like, but he doesn't, like, bat an eye. He's just like, oh, okay. I think it's one of Laura Dern's <laughs> best monologues ever. Yeah. I, one of the things I have said in the past is I think that that delivery deserves both an Oscar and a Razzie. <laughs> I think so, too, yeah. It was very, like, bizarre. I just, all of this shit is bizarre. I don't know. The yeah. Delivery's, it's funny. It's so weird. Funny. And so, um, there's, like, an, an emo Kyle McLaughlin... An emo comic. Kind of yeah, because he's all like, oh, like just like sad sulking. about it. Yeah, because he's sad about the whole thing. Okay. So I have like emo McLaughlin, emo McLaughlin. I try to like, you know, work it into like a pun, but it didn't work out. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I have, um, he goes back to her apartment and he, does. he knocks on her door and she says like. I looked for you in my closet tonight. Yes! <laughs> I wrote that down, too. I love it. She, like, invites him in, like, all warmly, like, I looked for you in my closet tonight. <laughs> it's crazy where you come from. It's crazy. <laughs> like, your closet. Okay. And then they kiss. Yeah. And we can, they get it on. They get it on, right? And there's, like, red, red drapes. Um, they just kiss, right? They just kiss at that point. Because then they cut to Jeff watching Dorothy by himself now without Laura, without Sandy, and he's at the Slow Club, and she she does her rendition of Blue Velvet again, again. and he's drinking his Heineken watching her, and he also notices that Frank is there, That's and right. Frank is almost in tears like watching. He has a her. piece of yeah velvet blue velvet he's, he's like, holding the piece of the robe that he had cut off after he raped her. That's what it was. Yeah. Oh. So like he's kind of like crying and holding off holding on to this piece of blue velvet <laughs> which is kind of funny i mean the whole movie is like horrible and funny all at the same time yeah, it's hill horrible hill horrible <laughs> hill horrible yeah and that's what's yeah. so great about it because like it makes you feel different things all at once and that's what i really love about this movie is like 
you it's not even like open for interpretation it forces you to feel multiple feelings all at once yeah and that's something that i think is like something very rare among directors you know because usually they want like you to feel a specific way whereas this movie allows you to feel multiple ways simultaneously yeah and i think it's like because it it doesn't take itself too seriously, and then it also takes itself too seriously. <laughs> you know, at the and same time. that's what's great about yeah, it. Yeah, it's great. Because it's like, it's so rare in cinema to see something that just fucks with your emotional thought and, and feelings that way. Yeah, and you're not sure if it's supposed to be like a parody or it's supposed to be like a serious movie. You know, like mm-hmm. that whole feeling? Yeah. 100%, yeah. Absolutely. It's very rare. So anyway, uh, outside the parking lot of the Slow Club, Frank and his goons are like, getting into the car and Jeffrey decides to follow them. Yeah. And he's in this like industrial area and there's like a projection on the industrial area, like a projector, like there is. Yeah. I don't know, recall exactly what I remember. It was like proje- something was projected oh. on the area, which made it look, you know, kind of fake. Okay. You know what I mean? Like it looked like a set in a way. Okay. Um, I did not catch that. And then, uh, it, you find out it's Frank's place because I think it, it's a close up of, um, the mail box and it said like Frank Booth. Okay. Sure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, because um, yeah, Jeffrey finds out where Frank lives in the process yeah. of following them. And then um, I think it cuts to uh, him at the high school. There's like a yeah. radio DJ who's like all logs, logs, logs. <laughs> <laughs> they lumber ten. Love the logs and mm-hmm. lumber ten. Mm-hmm. So. And yeah, so Jeff pulls up in his cool like convertible to pick up Sandy, but. This right across the street is football practice, and that's where Mike, her boyfriend, is. And she's like, "Keep driving, keep driving." And he sees it. Yeah. He's like he catch- super gels. Yeah, and so he, <laughs> yeah, so he sees like all the he or Mike sees from football practice that Sandy's like talking, talking to the student in the convertible, and Sandy's like, "Fuck, dude." He like gets really like unreasonably upset but I guess it's high school so you gotta be jealous it's totally know? high school yeah it's like uh uh-huh, yeah. you talking jealous to a person mm-hmm. so that's cute and then they go to the diner Arlene's and, and he says what I I don't know did you write this quote down no he's like I love this line see that clock on the wall five minutes from now you're not going to believe what I've told you <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like it came, comes from like a, an old video game or something yeah and also <laughs> one of the things he says is like uh, in this scene is he says I'm in the middle of a mystery <laughs> which when he says that is the exact middle point of the 120 minutes of the film really yeah that is so cool yeah ah so, so that wow. was another little cool factoid that I found out. That is really awesome. Yeah. I'm Man. in the middle of a mystery. Do you, like, literally. <laughs> do you think that that was on purpose or that was just like crazy timing? That was on purpose. Wow. Yeah. All the detail. Yeah. It's so great. I'm, I'm glad somebody put some fucking thought into it. Please turn the tape over to side two. Part two in two weeks. The Secret Podcast of Laura Palmer is created by Paul Medley and produced by Amanda J. Music is by Revenue LLC. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at TSPOLP or email us at TSPOLP at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we'll see you with part two of our Blue Velvet in two weeks well wait no we'll we'll see you in because that didn't sound that wasn't a full complete sentence (laughs) kind of Um, we'll see you for our part two Blue Velvet podcast in two weeks fuck sorry go ahead (laughs) we'll we'll see you for our part two of the Blue Velvet podcast in two weeks see ya see ya